You ever you ever get nervous before you go on? Uh, like when I'm gonna go on camera. Mm -hmm. Um, I the only time I've gotten nervous was because typically I'll be by myself and recording like mm -hmm. in front of like a camera, but I'm doing it all by myself. Uh, but the time I did get nervous was I had to do like an like an anchor like a practice run. And the two main anchors were watching me, mm -hmm. and even though it wasn't airing or anything, I got nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I always get nervous even like coming in, and I know that once it, whenever I once it starts, then I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And so I just have to tell myself it's gonna be alright. Yeah. Be yeah. Good to know that. Okay. Is that on, Carrie? Is that live working out? Oh. All right. Good. Good. Perfect. All right. Cool. Hello. Hello. We're going to get started here in about 30 seconds. I think, uh, are we all on here? Or is there anybody that we don't have on here? Should we, should we put my, should I put myself on mute? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yep. It, It's okay for me now. Okay. Thanks, Franco. Did that work? Did you get it? Ready? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right, can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first guest speaker series. I think we're going to call it Arrowcast. Get it? The Archer and the Arrow? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this morning, our first guest of the year is Geraldine Torellis. Did I say that right? Yes. All right, that's excellent. And uh, so she comes to us from Walter Cronkite School of Journalism from Arizona State University, but she's got quite a bit of other background, which is pretty cool. So we'll talk about all that stuff today. We, we do, uh, should we start with the video of you? Would that help or do we want to uh, start with some questions? Maybe, maybe we start some questions. Let's do with the questions, perfect. Bit. Yeah, let's do a little bit of background here. That We have some clips that we'll show you of uh, some of Geraldine's work. So I think it's a, a really cool opportunity for some of our kids that are interested in digital broadcasting and those kind of things to be able to kind of see some of these productions and a lot of things like we're doing with Archer TV. So let's just start out with the basics. Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, um, and I moved here when here to Arizona when I was about three. Um, I actually grew up here in Maricopa, um, and I went to school out in like the Ahwatukee area. Okay, where did you go to high school? Desert Vista. All right, did you go there all four years? Yeah, I went all four years there. Did uh, what was that like? Did you play sports? Did you were you involved in any extracurricular activities? Did you do journalism there? I didn't do journalism uh, in high school, but I did play golf. Uh, I started my sophomore year, and uh, I played sophomore through senior year of high school. I hear you were pretty good at golf. I was okay. All right. <laughs> what was your favorite? What was your favorite class in high school? Um, I'm like trying to recall because it feels like it's been forever ago. Um, I always liked like I always liked the Spanish courses that I took. Um, did you already I, speak Spanish? Uh, you know, not really. That's my mom's fault. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, um, I, I enjoyed Spanish classes, and I actually liked uh, language arts. Awesome, awesome. That's. Did you have a favorite teacher at DV? It's a big school, but. Man, yeah, I had. I did have some really good professors uh, in school. Um, some of them were language arts teacher, teachers. I had some good math teachers. There were a lot of good teachers at, at Desert Vista. Were there, any, were there any classes that you really were uncomfortable in or that you'd hated? Or were there any topics in school that you were just like, I don't know why I'm... Yeah, yeah. So my first year, I was in orchestra. And um, I had loved orchestra when I was in middle school okay. um, because I had a great teacher. And then um, when I went to high school, uh, my teacher was 
So <laughs> she got me to not like orchestra anymore. And actually, it was a blessing in disguise because that's what got me into golf. And golf okay. made, you know, that was the right path. Uh, but I also struggled in math a lot and would okay. have to show up to office hours early in the morning and bother my teachers so that they could help me. <laughs> we had a discussion about that. I'm a, I'm a math teacher at times, and so I, I was not a very... I, I didn't like math in high school either, so it's, I think that's a, that's okay. But I think a lot of it is teacher dependent too, and so hopefully, hopefully kids are having fun with that. Mm -hmm. All right, what year did you graduate from high school? Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. So that's not too long ago. It feels like it, but I guess not. Yeah, it's not really that long. Ago. So what's changed when I was so when I was in so I graduated in nineteen ninety nine, and there were still like paper applications to college. There was that whole process. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the college what was the college entry process for you? So did you what did you do? Where did you go to college? Did you play golf? You played golf in college, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, I played at South Mount Community College for two years, um, and that was kind of just talking. I, I wasn't quite ready uh, as far as golf goes because that's all I was really focused on mm -hmm. at the time. I wasn't quite ready to play at a four year. Uh, university. Okay. I needed to kind of hone in my skills a little more because I did kind of start a little late. Um, and so I wanted to stay local so that I could continue um, working with my coach that I had been seeing some really good progress with. with. So um, I went to South Mount Community College, kind of talked to just a few different mm -hmm. coaches mm -hmm. around the valley and then ended up landing there. Um, and then my, and then I went on to play two years at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Okay. Um, and that was a little bit of a, of a more trickier process because mm -hmm. my goal was to play at the Division One level. Um, and so uh, my stepdad, he just created like he hand wrote a list of like every Division One university, mm -hmm. and he wrote the emails of yeah. every coach. And he was like, okay, this is your homework, and he had me email every single division one coach um, to you know put myself out yeah. there. Um, I played in a like a college combine where different coaches came okay. to watch you play. Um, and that's actually where I met my coach at UTRGV. That's awesome. Yeah. That's what's the what's the what's the work life school schedule of like a college athlete? Because I think a lot of kids don't understand like how much time that only goes into preparing so that you can get to that level mm -hmm. to play at the collegiate level, whether it's community college level or D1. And then it's just, it's an even different beast when you're taking college classes, you're on your own, mm -hmm. and then you have golf to deal with. So what was your daily schedule like throughout those, those years? And did it change much from South Mountain and then moving to Texas was your schedule? Okay. What was that lifestyle like on a daily basis for you during season? Yeah, so um, community college was way more relaxed mm -hmm. than the division one level. Right. Um, for community college, um, the, um, the classes were pretty basic mm -hmm. too. So um, that was like not a big deal for me. And then um, going to, we would just go to practice after school um, and practice for a few hours and it wasn't super demanding. Right. I would get there early and I'd stay late mm -hmm. because I wanted to get better. Right. Um, so then from, to go from the community college level and then yeah, we really weren't even like required to work out or anything. And then to go to the D1 level, it was a totally different ball game. Um, practice was way more intense. The school was like the schooling was more intense mm -hmm. at a university level. Um, and we also were required to work out. Um, the amount of tournaments that we played was way more intense. And the fact that we had to travel so much, right. um, and where I was going to school, we would have to fly everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it was like constant traveling, um, playing tournaments and in, community college we, we would only play like 18 holes a day mm -hmm. and we would just play for like two days I think um, at the D1 level you're either playing 18 holes three days in a row or you play 36 holes oh. in one day and then 18 the next and 36 holes in one day is literally you're there from sun sunrise to sunset so that's crazy when you, when you were in Texas so that was in that was in McAllen Texas mm -hmm. which is a border town yeah familiar with that area a little bit how, how different is that than like you know you grew up in the Phoenix area which is I mean Arizona is a border state yeah. what's the difference between like the border areas in like Texas particularly like South Texas mm -hmm. in that area versus Arizona and kind of being from 
Ahwatukee and Maricopa a little bit. Yeah, so um, I think that a lot there's a lot of similarities as far as like the culture, mm -hmm. um, but in South Texas, um, it was you would go to um, to any store or any business mm -hmm. and they likely were to speak Spanish to you yeah. and um, and I mean I thought that that was great and good for me to practice my Spanish mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah definitely it was like a different it was much more there's like a much more higher um, population of Hispanics mm -hmm. there and so um, but pretty similar in the fact that we also have a pretty high right. um, Hispanic population here too so I love living in Texas I live there for six seven six seven or eight, six seven years I love that I had some some work that I had to do in that Rio Grande Valley area and I was just being from the Midwest when you're down in those areas you're like man this is a really different world yeah. and you get a chance to see a lot of people's perspectives and mm -hmm. what people try to uh, how hard it is just for people to kind of live out their dreams and have opportunities and, and things like that so that's probably why you had to fly everywhere mm -hmm. I don't think people understand like that area is like you're far away from everything <laughs> yeah everything that's awesome so that you go to so you go to Texas you play golf there you graduated and then what did you do after you graduated from college? I taught for four years. Um, I taught kindergarten, um, which was... That's awesome. It was a great experience, challenging, right. but um, I loved working with uh, the little kids. <laughs> How old are the kids now that you first started with your, your first kindergarten class? Oh, gosh. I think, they're, I think they're in fourth fourth or fifth grade now, which is crazy. Do you ever see any of them? Do you ever um, bump I, into them? Because you're not here very much anymore. But Yeah, so when I was still teaching and they had moved on, they would come and see me. And every time we'd see each other, it was like, they were so cute. But um, now, yeah, I don't really see them much anymore. There were some that I had developed like really good relationships mm -hmm. with. And since I don't have kids, it was like, hey, yeah, let's go, let's go get like Froyo or let's go to yeah. the park. You know, and so we would just kind of hang out outside of school. But that's awesome. Yeah, we, we have, I've lost touch with a lot of them. What, uh, what was the hardest part about being a teacher, in particular, like a kindergarten teacher? Um, patience, having patience for, <laughs> uh, for you know, kids, especially kids that um, have never been to school. Mm -hmm. And so you're having to teach them how to be a student. And that's, yeah, it's a lot of really, it'd be, I mean, think about if you were a kindergarten teacher now, thinking about kids that haven't really even had daycare or preschool because of COVID, I mean, they haven't had a chance to really socialize with kids. I have a five-year-old niece that just turned five. And so the question was, well, do we start her in school this year? Like we think, we think she's smart enough, mm -hmm. you know, because we've been working with her the last couple of years, but at the same time, she's never really ever been around kids. Right. And so that social thing is going to be a much different transition for her going from everybody's been working at home and she had some medical conditions, so she can't really go out anyway during COVID. Yeah. So it's going to be that that transition going in, how she's going to work with other kids and things like that. But hopefully, she'll be okay. So hopefully, she has a patient teacher like you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what made you? So you were a kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. and now you're at ASU mm -hmm. in a master's program at Cronkite. Mm -hmm. So how did that transition? What made you want to make that transition and do journalism and and go to to go to grad school at ASU? Yeah. So um, I've always been very passionate about um, social justice issues, and um, I just about um you know people being treated the right way all people no matter what you look like or you know what language you speak and so that's always been very important to me um and i had a student uh, my first year that had been going through um, something really bad at home and she ended up uh, being taken by CPS and uh, it really that had like a really big impact on me uh, I actually wanted to be a lawyer after that um, I was uh, considering don't um, do it don't <laughs> do it I was um, I was considering going into family law um, and you know trying to advocate for children like her that had gone through something so terrible um, and then realized that that wasn't really the right path for me mm -hmm. um, and because I'm just not the kind of person that can just sit in an office all day I need to be out and so mm -hmm. I thought well there's a way that I could, can advocate for people and be out and see the world and travel and see new places and um, that's how I landed on journalism. It's crazy I think that the teaching is such an exhilarating profession or job if you will to see the growth and development of kids and all those positive things that go along with it but that other side of it when you 
when you truly get a chance to learn and love the kids mm -hmm. and then you see them go through these things and since they're kids like they can't control it right. i mean their whole environment is dictated by people mm -hmm. other than them and it's hard to say to a kid hey you know this this time period will not last that long mm -hmm. at one point you'll be on your own mm -hmm. but that I, I always think about things like that mm -hmm. even to this day i think about those really sad cases and it's just it makes it it makes it difficult but then it gives you a sense that you know a lot of jobs that people have they might not feel like a purpose in that job and i right. think sometimes in teaching when you come across those situations and you can be there for a kid and i've had the opportunity to i've been in this business long enough to now kids are grown up that had those issues before mm -hmm. and kind of seeing how some of them have really thrived on that adversity early in life mm -hmm. and really made them a lot more successful later in life but then you still have the ones that it still affects them because they didn't have the coping skills and didn't want to they didn't know how to work with people or trust adults to really be able to work through some of those issues as they were going on and i think after we get through covid i think kids are going to have kind of the same things i didn't we didn't know what kids home lives were like where they were and so when they're coming back and if there's gaps in academics or things like that you're just like i don't know where I don't know how to close that gap sometimes because there's that social experience that you had at home there's that online learning experience that you had at home so it's, it's certainly different I'm, you're lucky that you got out of teaching a little bit right before that stuff happened so well, i i taught for i think a year after covid okay and that was kind okay. of what burned me out a little okay. bit because it was yeah because i you know like you said you had kids that um you know had been stuck home and mm -hmm. hadn't been socialized and didn't go to preschool and then i talked you know going into kindergarten that year i was like okay <gasps> but yeah. they were actually a pretty good group of kids like the last group of kids i had was pretty good but still it was like a lot it's pretty, it's, so what so what was the application process for grad school so you you went away where a lot of times kids when they or i shouldn't say kids after you graduate from college some folks if they're going to go to grad school they go right away Others take a year or two mm -hmm. off and they try out a profession. Mm -hmm. Others go into a career for a long time and then they realize that wasn't their career. Mm -hmm. So you were out in the real world for about four years, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so what was that process going? How'd you get into Cronkite? That, so what's that process like yeah. after you graduate from college? Yeah, so I mean, I took, I didn't really have like a clear path in my life because I didn't really know what I wanted to do until I landed on journalism. So, <laughs> um, so, once I made the decision that I was not going to teach anymore um, and that I wanted to pursue journalism, I actually applied to a school in England um, to a program out there that I was interested in. Um, and my parents were not super thrilled about it. Okay. Um, so they encouraged me to apply to Cronkite because it's a really great journalism program and it's right here in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't think I would get in. I was like, ah, well, I don't have any journalism experience and it's a really good school and it's kind of late. Cause like at this point it was like April mm -hmm. and I was trying to like get into school by August. So yeah. I was like, it's a little late. They probably already have accepted every student they're gonna let into the program. Um, and I thought that it would be like, you know, much more competitive as a master's program. Mm -hmm. So I was like, the chances of me made, I just didn't, you know, have, I didn't believe in myself enough that I thought I would get in. So um, I went ahead and I applied to ASU and U of A. Okay. Um, and I, um, I actually used my experience with that student as um, to write my personal statement. Awesome. Um, I had a good GPA in um, my undergrad. Um, and I also mentioned you know my golf experience and I think my teaching experience it's like a, a mixture of all these different experiences that I was able to put into the application and my statement and um, yeah and I got a call a few days later that um, that's awesome that they were interested in, in having me in the program and the Dean called me on my birthday to uh, to go. tell me that I got in so that was a nice birthday gift to myself I guess that's awesome <laughs> that's all I think that's the important piece I mean I think that when when you're I think is what a lot of people don't understand is that at competitive colleges and in competitive master's programs, like everybody's going to have a good GPA. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to have a list of volunteer experience. And so it's going to be those, what did you really take from those personal experiences that somebody can say they're going to translate and make those adaptable into what they're doing. So when I think about your story, being in Arizona, doing golf, starting at the community college level, then going D1, moving across the country to Texas, 
and then being in the Rio Grande Valley and then coming back and teaching. I mean, if you're a if you're a, an employer or if you're a, a college admissions officer, like those are really unique experiences mm -hmm. that are just different than the kid that has just always just done what they're supposed to do the entire time and they're just going straight through it because there's a million of those type of kids. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be filling those programs too, but I think it's a lot of the times it's the soft skills and it's the experiences that people learn from mm -hmm. that really make that. So that's that's really cool. So then, so when did that start? So how long have you been in this program? Is this your... My final semester. I'm, okay. going, I'm going into my final semester now. Uh, I start next week. And uh, it was only a year and a half, so I started last year. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so uh, it's been it's been going really fast, but it's been a really good learning experience. Um, under I've been learning under some really great professors, um, and yeah, I'm almost done, which is crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Should we take a look at some of your yeah. some of your work real quick? All right, so we're gonna try to we've got some uh, little clips here, so we'll see if this works. Um, let's see, so I'm going to present now in a tab. There we go. You guys are probably a little bit more technical at Cronkite than, <laughs> than this, and that's okay. All right. I'm presuming that you guys can all see this, and so we're just going to go ahead and play this video and uh, give you a little bit more background about Geraldine. Is that for Birdie? <laughs> Is that for Birdie right there? For this segment of the Spring Spotlight Series, I'm going to be talking about a program that is helping kids get easier access to play ball. That organization is First Team. I'm Sarah Gray, I'm from the state legislature, and some of the health and fitness centers and teachers in the building have had this year in class. Almost as important to class and fitness skills, LGBTQ is actually a good thing. No. Okay. Thank you. Breaking Bad thing that happened out there? Man, you ever seen that show? Yeah. Oh, great show. Okay, all right. Okay, can you guys hear us back? So that was just a couple of clips right there. So what's been the coolest experience about being in Cronkite and get into journalism. Are you are you happy with your decision? You feel really comfortable with the direction yeah. that you're going? Yeah, um, I remember um, after I think like so I I have an interest in um, in immigration issues and um, after the first class that I took last my first semester um, where you know uh, it was like a prerequisite for a class that then I took last semester and I could talk about that because that was like my, like that was like the best experience I've had so far. But um, we, I, I remember leaving that class and I remember calling my mom and just saying like, yeah, this feels like I'm, I, this feels right to me. I feel like this is where I belong. Mm -hmm. And that was like the first time that I'd ever felt that way um, as far as like picking a career that I wanted to do. And I was 26 when I had finally decided to do that. Um, but that prerequisite was for a class that then we um, went to Tapachula, Mexico. Okay. Um, and that's a pretty unique experience to get in college because you're traveling to a different country and covering some very important issues. Mm -hmm. um, and in Tapachula, um, there were many migrants being held there, thousands of migrants. Um, and so we got to go and um, talk to migrants and people and um, you know, talk about their experiences and share their stories. And they're actually um, getting published now okay. from through Cronkite News. Those stories are being published, um, and that was a very um, it was a very challenging yeah. experience and seeing uh, what people were going through. 
Um, but it was very, I think, important to be able to share their stories. Where did you stay when you were there? How, how many days were you there? Like, what how what was the living situation like? I'm sure there weren't like hotels around and things like that. Where did like we actually did stay in a hotel, um, which felt weird mm -hmm. because we would go to this park where people were sleeping on the floor and you had these like like flattened cardboard boxes that people were sleeping on they had nothing um and even like you even see children mm -hmm. you know in these conditions and then to go to your hotel room after it felt wrong so i was like Ugh. so that was like the one thing but we were there for an entire week and it was like we got there and like hit the ground running mm -hmm. you know we had to have interviews set up prior um and like you know set up like appointments and go and like we'd have drivers take us to those appointments and we do our interviews and then shoot stand-ups well me and another one another reporter because everybody else was right. doing like written stories and i was doing like a, a broadcast speech which was one of the stand-ups that uh, was on that reel you ever feel scared i didn't okay yeah it was um so i don't speak spanish but my Spanish is proficient enough that I could communicate with okay. um, a lot of the people there. And so um, I had actually developed some really good relationships with some of the people from going back and seeing them okay. often and just talking to them. And um, and it was funny because um, they even would come up to me and say, you know, you're safe here. You're like family. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're going to look out for you kind of thing. So I actually never felt... I was ever in danger or anything. Yeah. I think, yeah, I felt very safe. I've known some, like, I've known some, like, uh, documentary film producers and some journalists, and I think there's there's something along the lines of what the what the mission statement of journalism is, where, I don't know, what's your mission? Like, what's your vision? What's, what's journalism mean to you? Because it sounds like you're trying to give people a voice. Mm -hmm. It sounds like those folks are really welcoming because they understood, like, this is how my story is going to get told right. and heard. So what does journalism look like now in the 21st century, like with the internet and things like that? Has it has it adapted or what's your view on journalism? Um, so that's something that we talk a lot, a lot about at school um, because, you know, journalism, the industry is struggling right now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's very, to me, journalism is about um, amplifying the voices of people who are ignored. Um, and I think that it's really important to um, report on communities and, um, and amplify those voices um, and not only cover the bad things that are happening, but also cover the good things that are happening are in those yeah, communities. Yeah. Because I think that a lot of times, like when you just cover the bad things in, in a community, like let's say a community like predominantly that is, um, you know, people of color, um, a lot of times it can perpetuate stereotypes mm -hmm. of, um, of those people. So I think that it's important to also talk about, you know, what's like the good things right. that are happening. I think, I think the one thing that I've learned in my life is that a lot of the negative things in my life were actually miracles mm -hmm. in disguise. It kind of where it transitioned you into, okay, this is the path that I want to go down. So like kind of like your kindergarten kid, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like you have that story and it's a really tough one to digest. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it led you in a direction where you can advocate and give a voice to a whole lot of people. So in a way, that's kind of like yeah. the miracle about that. That's mm -hmm. awesome. We're running a little bit out of time. Uh, let's get into some things that maybe like some things that you could help some of our high school high school folks with or our junior high kids. What's uh, what are some of your favorite books? So um, I am a huge Harry Potter fan. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, I. I've read those books several times and also watched the movie several times. Um, and then I recently have read two books that were really good. Um, one of them is The Tiny Warrior, um, which is about um, uh, a man that goes to his grandfather, um, you know, pretty much like, I don't, like he doesn't like know really like the direction, he doesn't like the direction that his life has taken and he doesn't feel like he's been successful and he had these dreams that he didn't go for and whatnot and so he goes to his grandfather his grandfather starts telling him the story because they're um, indigenous and uh, tells him the story of the little tiny warrior um, from long 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 time ago he's sharing like a story and about the experiences that the tiny warrior went through and he was able to relate those situations to 
um, this the main character's life. And That's awesome. Yeah, he was able to kind of figure out. Oh wait, no, I can do this, and he and it was it had a really cute end. That's really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that, that it, there are always lessons in life, and I think that's the thing that I want kids to understand. It's like not every lesson is going to be great, but every lesson can be used mm -hmm. in some way or the other. So to be able to relate those stories of the tiny warrior yeah. and understand that it all translates, mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome. Is there a, what, what, what's some of the best advice that you've ever been given, or what, what type of advice would you give kids nowadays? Is you know Because I think your story, I, I think that kids don't need to know what they're going to do. Right. in their life right now and you don't have enough life experiences to really know yeah. where your passions and interests are yeah. you know you had to travel all the way to texas then you became a teacher to kind of get that and yeah. obviously you've got a really good head on your shoulders so i think that's the i think that's the point for kids it's like you don't have to know now mm -hmm. you got to remain open you got to give yourself options yeah. so try to do well at school try to be personal with people yeah. um, what's some of the what's some of the best advice you've ever been given or that you would like to offer to some of our students um some of the best advice that I've been given is um, it's three words that I heard all the time from my stepdad. Uh, he would say, practice, practice, practice. Okay. <laughs> and he would refer to golf, but I yes, think <laughs> I think that that's now something that um, I can even apply to what I'm doing now because obviously like getting in front of a camera and being and having to speak is something that takes practice. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that's some great advice that I got and then I totally agree that um, you know you're I, I'm assuming that most of your 18 and under 18 might be pushing it a little bit so probably 17 or under but um, you don't have to feel like you have to have your whole life figured out because I didn't I wasn't even close when I was I was that age I mm -hmm. had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and um, I just kind of did, you know, did different experiences and did different things and kind of learned and ended up falling on this. And so you don't have to have everything figured out right now, but just, you know, work hard and work hard and, and practice, <laughs> practice things. It's okay. I think that the, the best part about practice is that you get better by failing and you're only going to fail a lot if you practice a lot. That's just inherently. Anybody have a, was, did you try to say something, Mrs. Reese there? Thank you, Mr. Wong. I, I know there are a couple of questions. So awesome. We can, uh, we can open it up. I'd love that. Students, that would be great. Okay, so I have one from, uh, let's see, so we have, uh, yeah, I like this one. We were talking about this earlier. This is from Mrs. Vargas's class. What's the best advice you can give students about speaking on camera? We talked about this earlier a little bit. What, yeah. what, uh, what, do you, what would you give those folks? Um, well, I had, I just completed an internship at a new station and, um, one of the anchors was giving me some advice as far as, um, um, she literally just told me that you just need to practice. And, um, she was like, it was funny cause she was pulling out scripts mm -hmm. that people had used like from like a recycling bin and she hands them to me. She's like, just read, mm -hmm. just practice and read. And you're going to get so comfortable with talking and, um, and, and, and you're going to get so comfortable with the way, like with how you need to, you know, accent certain words and whatnot that, you know, so just reading, reading, reading just aloud, reading. any book, any yeah. newspaper, just trying to say, okay, other than just like reading it, like I read it in my head read it. Like I need yeah. to communicate because words have meanings. And so yeah. emphasis on those words, right. pauses have meanings, right. nonverbal things have yeah. meanings. So that's really, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. Keep practicing, read. Mm -hmm. All right. Has your own beliefs ever changed the way you cover a story? That's a great one for yeah. journalism yes. right there. Yeah. So with journalism, it's important to um, stay balanced. Um, and so while I do have my um, my beliefs and my opinions, uh, everyone does. Um, it's important to make sure that when you're covering a story, you try to get both sides. Um, and I actually got some great advice from a, a reporter at this news station too that I was interning at that she told me that um, when she's making uh, like her videos, she will give the same amount of time to someone on both sides. So right. like if this person, um, for example, I don't know if you're covering um, uh, abortion and so you have one well, person way to pick a light topic there. i know there you go. That's <laughs> awesome. is, so but you know you have some like you give like 10 seconds to mm -hmm. a person that's pro-life and then 
you know, 10 seconds to someone that's pro-choice. And so you're getting a balance, you're getting both so, sides. So it's like a professional safeguard from, yeah. your, from our own. Everybody has natural prejudices. Right. And I think that's the thing. We don't realize that we all have natural pre prejudices. So I think for me, it's been, if I was going to answer that question, yeah, I think, you know, you, we think we have beliefs and opinions until we really get a firsthand account of either being in that person's situation or seeing something firsthand and then it opens it up and be like, okay, that's my belief because it's based on my experiences and my perspective. Right. But as you go out and see more of the world and you meet more people, you realize that, okay, their beliefs and their opinions aren't any less valid. Right. Their opinions and beliefs are based on their perspective, just like mine was based on my perspective. We have a really diverse country, so obviously you're gonna have mm -hmm. a lot of different perspectives that form people's beliefs. Mm -hmm. so that's a great question. Uh, oh yeah, so your, your internship was actually in Tucson, right? So what was the channel and then what was your, what was your day like during that internship? Yeah, so um, I was interning for KLD News 13 um, and I, I did a little bit of everything. So every day was pretty much, like each week was kind of like it just changed because they wanted me to do uh, one week of digital. Uh, two weeks of producing. I was with the reporter for three weeks. They had me in the control room. They had it's me awesome. a shadow you anchor. See everything. Yeah, so I I saw like the ins and outs of how a newsroom works, which is really cool because like when you watch the news on TV, you don't think about how mm -hmm. it's all put together. And so to be able to go behind the scenes and see how it all comes together behind the scenes, and um, so yeah, I mean it was just I would. I would go and typically I would work um, like the night side shifts. Okay. So I'd get there at like two and then sometimes I'd stay till like 1030. Um, and yeah, it was just, I um, I particularly enjoyed um, shadowing the reporters because mm -hmm. that's what I'm interested in. And uh, we would just, um, you know, she would be making calls, trying to mm -hmm. set up interviews. That's awesome. We'd go out in the car and go to the interviews. Uh, she would shoot her, um, like her video and, uh, live shots so yeah just kind and of get, seeing and, and get a chance to see these people personally and like yeah. what, you know there's yeah. a difference from when they're on camera and how they're and then yeah. i'm sure there's a difference in how they really are but <clears throat> right that's awesome you, you, so it sounded like a very valuable internship yeah yeah i think like the biggest thing that i am able to take away from that is being able to talk to the reporters and they were able to give me a lot of advice and insight into the, the industry and so i thought that that was really good that's awesome very very cool um Oh, when can you come and speak to Gallagher's journalism class and Vichcom classes? Soon. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very, very awesome. Are there any other questions out there? Any other questions? This has been awesome. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. I'm trying to think of uh, what's your favorite TV show? Uh, Friends. <laughs> I think I, I see kids with friends stuff around here. I didn't know kids knew about friends, but they do. Maybe she can uh, talk about a little bit about the cost of the master's program and uh, how she actually got in. Okay, yeah, and how, how do kids pay for college now and things like that? So, how, yeah, what's the. Uh, well, I, um, I'm trying to think of how, because yeah. um, I ended up getting a, a scholarship um, to the program. That's awesome. Thank you. So, um, that. Uh, significantly reduced the price uh, for how much it was um, so I'm not really was the was the scholarship something that they gave you to when you enrolled like during on admission um, so I um, why it's fun yeah know, right? <laughs> um, so yeah after I had enrolled and um, after they had read my personal statement mm -hmm. and my had gone through my application they offered me that scholarship Okay. Um, and, and it's, I haven't had to, um, it, it's basically like, um, like, a like a, it's, I'm like working for the school kind of. And so, um, I haven't had to do it the last two semesters, mm -hmm. but I'll be doing it for this next semester where, um, they're going to have me report on, um, uh, like health disparities, um, in different awesome. communities here in Arizona. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, so I haven't so, gotten to do it yet, but that's what the scholarship's for. Basically. That's awesome. It so. sounds like a really good business decision yeah. you know, on their part. They're getting some work out of it. And, right. and I think that's the thing that kids need to understand, too, is that just because you don't have a scholarship going to a program, once you're there, there's a lot of scholarships if you're doing well. Right. And that's, that's what I found at IU. Like, I didn't have necessarily any scholarships going there. 
But when I got there in the first semester, I did really well. Then you start finding all these mm -hmm. things on campus and professors sponsor you and all this right. other stuff. So like, I think cost, I think for kids is always on the top of their, their mind and parents' mind, but there are always ways to do it. Right. So just like you're working and producing things. I worked in college mm -hmm. as an RA, which okay. kind of helped me get ready for teaching. I never thought I'd be a teacher with that, you know, but that was a really cool experience. We have uh, Michaela, oh, here, Mrs. Miss Patterson's on here. Oh, this is a good one. I think teachers can associate this one too. How do you cope and reset after covering a difficult story? So kind of like that kindergarten example, but now you're older, you have yeah. more experience. How do you? Yeah, so um, that in particular, as far as um, going to Tapachula and seeing all that and how, and that it, it did have an impact on me. Um, and I think I just, you know, I had to focus on doing the story, you know, because mm -hmm. like we got back and the work wasn't over. I had to listen to the interviews and, um, you know, my mom had to help me with like some uh, translating and stuff. So kind of, it felt like I was like reliving it and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was hard, but um, yeah, I mean, after I, um, once I got done with the stories, I had been resting and just kind of doing the things that I love to do. I think that's really important to, to do the things that make you happy mm -hmm. and uh, I love to paddleboard. It brings me peace. Okay. So yeah, just sticking to the things that you love to do to be able to kind of um, recharge and heal from right. the things that you know. And I think it, it probably helps that you're you're in a in a in a profession or industry that gives you purpose. And so it's like okay, this is this is part of the responsibility. Anytime anybody has a big responsibility, there's going to be a price tag mm -hmm. on it. And teachers teachers go through the same thing. They're it's a it's a fun job on most days, but. There are really tough ones, and you have to at least go to bed at night think, thinking, but at least it's me. At least I'm the best person in the position to kind of deal with that. And I hope most teachers feel that way because they really are like the front line yeah. on some of those things. So recharging mm -hmm. and resetting after those things so you can go forward the next day and help kids is, right. is awesome. That's, that's, a great, that's a great question. Uh, last question here is uh, from Coach Reese. How did you get your internship and what resources did you need to provide? So it sounds like you had a really good in, like, personal statement, but then... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, and then the internship, um, so I, I had wanted to do an internship and then through the school, and by the time that I was like gonna apply um, and do my, um, like I had to send in a resume and all this mm -hmm. stuff, I was in Mexico and then I didn't have time, and so I was like, man, I missed out on this opportunity because I wanted to take advantage of all the opportunities mm -hmm. that I got from ASU, and so, um, when I was on summer break, um, the internship like coordinator had sent out an email that this company, it's called Gray TV, um, they're the ones that own KOLD, and um, they were looking for interns, like a, they, were, they started this fellowship with ASU. Okay. And so, um, and I remember seeing like, this is a great opportunity for uh, broadcast reporters, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my gosh, so I, um, I applied, and um, I hadn't heard back for a little bit. And I was like, man, I didn't get it. And then I got an email that um, like kind of asked me some questions and then um, they let me know that I, I got in. That's and awesome. So, yeah, so it was, it was through my school um, because ASU has a lot of um, like internship opportunities. Um, if you, um, you know, are checking your emails um, and I'm sure probably most colleges are this way too, but yeah, like checking your emails and seeing like, what internship opportunities there are yeah. and applying whenever you can because um, you know you you get only a certain amount of time that you're in school and take advantage of every right. opportunity that the school offers you for sure and especially at these big schools yeah there's so many things going on in these big campuses and so many opportunities and you look back and you're like man I'll never have that opportunity to do those things or experience those for free again or see these speakers or go to this yeah. museum yeah. exhibit or something like that yes Mrs. Reese Oh, that's not fair. Okay. What is it? Maurice. Oh, Maurice Doss. Maurice Doss's question is, what's one thing you would advise for student athletes going into college? Great question from Maurice. What is one thing? Hmm. I would say, I mean, just be be prepared to um, be prepared to work hard uh, because you're going to have to juggle you're gonna have to juggle school and you're gonna have to juggle your sport. And it can be hard to, um, it can be hard to juggle both of them and then also have like, you know, 
your free time to be able to be with your friends, especially like in college, you right. want to hang out. Um, be focused because it can be really easy to get distracted when you're going into school and if you're going away for the first time and you're not around your parents anymore, a lot different it can be very d easy to kind of go off the off track. And so get distracted. stay focused, yeah. um, focus on school. School's really important because they always say that you're a student athlete, the student comes first. So yeah. make sure you're getting good grades so that you don't have to miss out on playing your sport. <laughs> and getting good habits about managing your time and managing the people yeah. that you're around That's and right. whether they have some similar goals because if you're gonna to need to manage that kind of stuff, you might as well get some practice now. Yeah. Thank you for visiting today. So here's what we got. So I know that we have some uh, PLP worksheets that a lot of teachers kind of knew about from last year. We'll do a better job moving forward. But here's what I want to offer, a little prize for our, our students that took really good notes, either on the worksheet or took some of their own personal notes. So I'm going to have uh, the advisory teachers at some point today are going to collect any of those sheets or any notes like that. And I've got some Nintendo Switch gift card things. And so I'll give one of these to each of the advisory teachers and uh, they'll take a look at your, your guest speaker forms and any notes that you took, and they're going to uh, pick a really great one and so that uh, we can hand out some Nintendo eShop Switch nice. gift cards, courtesy of uh, Mr. Price, as you guys continue to get some of these things. So uh, that's excellent. Thank you for being our first segment, our guest speaker this year. That was awesome. Thank you for sharing all of your experiences. I'm glad that uh, we got a chance to meet you, and if, if any kids have questions, we can get in touch with you and kind of get you connected with them as they get older too. Yes. Sound good? Sounds good. Thank you. All right, Archers, welcome to, thanks for visiting Aerocast. Teachers have a great Friday. Don't forget about our wonderful PD starting at 1.30 p.m. today. Students have a great weekend. Make sure you stay hydrated and make good choices, weigh the pros and cons. This has been Archercast. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out today. All right, have a great Friday, everyone. See ya. How'd it go? Is um, it all right? The only thing that was like weirding me out, if I'm being totally honest, was that you kept garden? having, you kept, no, that was fine. I oh. like that actually. You have having light, like little lighty things like roll over your face and shoulder. Oh, and I could not figure out for the life of me what it was doing. It might have been this. It would fly. I'm like, what was happening? <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. Yeah.